from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book, which is the A Reading Promotion arm of the library. And I'm very pleased that to welcome you here. It's a real pleasure to have Anthony Pitch back for a second book talk for the Center for the Book. The first one was more than a decade ago. It was actually July 28, 1998. It was two years before we started webcasting our talks. So this time we have him and we're looking forward to being able to uh, enjoy his talk today uh, for a long time. We will have a question and answer session at the end of uh, Tony's talk, and then we will have the signing following. Uh, the books are here. They are on sale uh, at a discount for $25, but there will be time to buy them afterwards uh, as well as to get your books signed. During the question and answer period, uh, we hope that uh, may, there will be many questions. Uh, that will also become part of our webcast, and if you uh, are called on, uh, we're assuming that you've given us permission to broadcast your image as part of our discussion period following the, uh, the talk. Tony's first book was The Burning of Washington, The British Invasion of 1814. Uh, which was a selection of the History Book Club and also won the Maryland Historical Society's Annual Book Award. Now he has returned with another detailed, well-illustrated, Rockham Sockham historical record of important events set in Washington, D.C., and once again, it's a story that was not exclusively researched at the Library of Congress, but a good deal of it was, and you will hear about that as part of his talk. His new account of the Lincoln Conspiracy and its aftermath has the wonderful title, They Have Killed Papa Dead, The Road to Ford's Theater, Abraham Lincoln's Murder, and the Rage for Vengeance, a title that I know he's going to explain. Uh, Tony is well known to many of us at the Library of Congress, not only as a researcher, but as someone who is very familiar with our resources. And in fact, one year he was invited to give the Judith P. Austin Memorial Lecture, which is named in honor of one of our reference librarians and in a sense is a, a talk that specifically gives uh, a chance and an opportunity to learn more about the resources of the library. This one is a wonderful follow-up, I think, to the Judith Austin uh, talk. Uh, he is also known to C-SPAN and to national public radio audiences, particularly for his anecdotal histories of Washington, and he is called on to speak very often, often uh, in ways to commemorate some of the founding fathers about whom he knows so much. James Madison, uh, he, I know he's been involved with talking about Francis Scott Key. Uh, he's a wonderful storyteller and we're very pleased to have him back. He, by way of background, uh, he is a former journalist. He was a journalist in England, Africa, and Israel and was also a broadcast editor for the Associated Press. The new book has received excellent reviews and endorsements, including one from Harold Holzer, the co-chair of the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and the co-editor with Joshua Wolf Schenck of the Library of Congress's Big Lincoln Book and our big, one of our big contributions to the Lincoln Bicentennial. The book is called In Lincoln's Hand, His Original Manuscripts, and copies of that are on sale in the shop, not here today, but we encourage you to look into this wonderful book. One of the nice things that's just happened with that book, if you, I can digress for just a second, uh, the Center for the Book promotes one book projects around the country when communities come together to read and discuss one book. And it appears that we are going to be able to use uh, the Lincoln book, our big Lincoln book, in Lincoln's hand uh, for a one book project for an association connected with the Social Sciences Inst uh, Association and this will be debated and read during the year by these professional social science teachers 
And then at the convention in Atlanta, we will uh, bring together people to talk about their experience, but also some of the speakers uh, who participate, some of the uh, writers who participated in the book. So that's just one of the many, many angles uh, for this Lincoln, wonderful Lincoln period. Anyway, Mr. Holzer called They Have Killed Papa Dead a perfect storm of a book. It's my pleasure to introduce the author who created that storm, Anthony Pitch. Tony. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you all for coming on this terrible day. Uh, it's so cold outside, I really appreciate that. The last time I spoke here, there was a long line of people uh, afterwards for the book signing. I, I prefer to hold this, John, do you mind? Um, and uh, th I think it was the first one in line was, he said to me, my name is John, J-O-N, and I wrote J-O-H-N. So I hope you're here today, John. Uh, I'll write J-O-N. I decided to write this because I rate it the saddest story in American history. Uh, John F. Kennedy had a leg up in life. He didn't lack anything. Lincoln did it all on its own. Uh, he did it all on its own, and that's what appealed to me. Um, and it was epic. I always try and... Um, write about epic stories because they challenge me as a writer and I like the drama and the spectacle and um, the heroics. This one has it all in abundance. And I realized that from my other books, this is actually the seventh book, but I realized that I had a great advantage over everybody else who researches books because I live 20 miles north of here, I live in Potomac. Other researchers would have to fly in, and they'd have to rush through their research. How long could they spend without it becoming exorbitant? Uh, two weeks, three weeks even? I took nine years, and I was here so frequently. All I had really to do was find parking. <laughs> so I realized I was going to go for the diaries, the letters, the journals, because they would confide their secrets uh, and confidences and everything else without fear of eavesdroppers in their diaries and in their letters and journals. They wrote diaries and journals like we watch television. There was only gaslight, there were no entertainment distractions of the kind we have today. And so the 19th century people poured over their diaries and I hit pay dirt time and time again. It was very, very early into my research that I almost yelped with delight in the manuscripts division. When I found the papers, I knew the papers of Benjamin Brown French would be revealing. I didn't realize how revealing they would be. He was a notable in Washington. He had officiated at the laying of the cornerstone of the Washington Monument because he was a top mason. He was commissioner of public buildings. Uh, his mansion was where the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress is, so he was well known. And he knew the Lincolns better than anybody else in public life because he supervised the expenditures at the White House, which gave credence to what he wrote. And very early in my research, I found that he wrote a letter to a friend, and this is what he reported. It was to an, a relative. He said he was in the rotunda on Lincoln's second inaugural, six weeks before he was shot. Lincoln had just attended the swearing in of Andrew Johnson as vice president of the old Senate chamber. The president-elect then walked through the rotunda and a man burst through the crowd. He was a few feet behind Lincoln when French grabbed him. And the man struggled, and his eyes were blazing. He was fierce and uh, um, demanding that he had a right to be there. John West, a four-year uh, veteran of the Capitol Police, came over and helped restrain him. And then French thought, maybe he's a new congressman, I don't know. <laughs> and he released him. And Lincoln had been unaware of this. He walked through to the East Front for the inaugural. And they didn't uh, bother to question the motives of this man or his intentions because nothing had happened. 
Six weeks later, Booth shot Lincoln, and French looked at the photographs as they're now all over the country and said, that is the man that I restrained. So can you imagine? Now, I knew that French, he was a poet also, he was very well read, and he was perceptive. And so this was a feast when I found his papers. He kept writing to relatives, and I knew that people would disclose things to relatives and friends that they wouldn't disclose to government officials. He wrote that Mrs. Lincoln, this is immediately after the assassination, Mrs. Lincoln bought $1,000 worth of mourning goods a month before the assassination. What do you think possessed her to do that? Keep this information in your own house. So why she did that, I never found out. I tried to research the accounts of the uh, White House. All I found was $100 worth of uh, cambric, which had been bought uh, some time before, but nothing to match the $1,000. And then French almost was delirious with joy when he heard that four of the conspirators had been hanged. And he said it far better than I could have. This is what I tried to do. Get the authentic voice of the contemporaneous spectators and participants. When he heard that they'd been hanged, he said, I could have jumped on the shoulders of each as they hung after the ancient manner of rendering death certain. Well, how much more vivid can you get than that? And then there were other diaries that yielded things. I never knew what Lincoln's voice sounded like until I got the diary of a corporal who fought his way to within 20 feet of Lincoln at the second inaugural. And he later recorded in his diary, Lincoln had a loud, rather um, shrill, far-reaching, distinct voice. Perfect. Right on the button. Uh, there was another woman who attended the funeral service in the East Room of the White House, and she came back and confided in her diary of how um, they were given no time to pause and look at the face of this man. All they could do was walk around quickly and make room for others. But she left that room with the impression of how many uh, silver nails studded the coffin and the black material that was all over the place. So there was the architect of the Capitol, Thomas Walter, uh, an irritable, petulant man, Everybody else was overcome with grief when Lincoln's funeral was taking place and when he lay in state in the Capitol, not Thomas Walter. He wrote to his wife of how um, displeased he was that he'd lost a day's work and that the noise of the bands playing those funeral dirges was disturbing him. So this is the human angle that I tried to get all the way through because they would give it color and texture. They would separate it from dry recitations of historical uh, fact. And time and again, I got it. Um, there, was, um, uh, there was luck. Luck plays a, a great part, just like in, in daily life. You can have the persistence and dedication, uh, which is required of all researchers, but you do need a measure of luck. I was in New Oxford, 10 miles east of Gettysburg with my daughter. We love to go and look at antique places. This was a very large warehouse where about a hundred antique dealers uh, were showing their wares. We spent the better part of an afternoon looking at all these rusty exhibits. And then, uh, I don't know why, my eye caught something high up on the wall. It was a framed front page of a broadsheet newspaper with a glass front. And I buzzed the front uh, reception to bring it down for me because I'd seen the name Lincoln. They brought it down and I couldn't believe it. It was the New York Tribune, March 19, and a long story, column after column, on a plot to kidnap Lincoln and exchange him for Confederate prisoners. That was their Achilles heel. They couldn't match the manpower of the North. And until that moment, I had written off the government's chief prosecution witness, Lewis Weichmann, as a perjurer, or at best forgetful, because in his court testimony, he said he'd looked through the New York Tribune of March 19, and he uh, said that he'd seen the story about a plot to kidnap Lincoln. I came to my home from home, the Library of Congress and Manuscripts Division, and I scrolled the Tribune two weeks before that date, two weeks after, and I drew a blank. So I wrote him off as a liar. <laughs> 
but this one I found in the antique shop gave the date, the year, 1864. I had been looking at 1865, and so I found out he'd been telling a truth in court. And if I hadn't have glimpsed that front page, I would have written him off in my book as a perjurer. Uh, there was another incident in the National Archives. I went up to Trevor Plant, one of the fine archive, reference archivists they've got there, and at this point let me pay tribute to the magnificent help I got from the reference uh, uh, librarians down in the Manuscripts Division. Two of them are here, uh, Patrick and uh, Leah. Um, and without their help, I could not have found my way about around the labyrinth of all the uh, files that they have, the suggestions they gave, the deciphering the language, the tips about recent acquisitions, it all helped enormously. But I was in the National Archives and I said to Trevor Plant, four of these people convicted were sentenced to prison terms in the Dry Tortugas, uh, that's an island off Key West. I wanted to get the correspondence from the island to their families. And he suggested quite a few um, resources. And then he said amongst them was the Quartermaster General's files. When I'm given a box, I don't only go for one folder. I look at all, because there are numerous instances of papers being misfiled. And there was a folder there, which I didn't know existed, Samuel Arnold, one of those at the island prison. And in that folder was one single letter written by Arnold to the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, in November 1864, three months after he'd signed on to Booth's madcap scheme to kidnap the president. He was now applying for a pleading for a job from the Secretary of War. And I must have been the first person to unearth that since it was put in the file 143 years earlier. So those instances of luck enabled me to produce uh, a lot of new information. The book bulges. I use that word very confidently. It bulges with new information. And that was one of the biggest finds I got, Arnold's letters to Stanton. And I photographed it, and the, uh, the publisher gave me 48 pages for photographs. That takes up a full page. So that's what it was like um, when my hunches turned out to be correct. That's where I would have to go, the letters, the diaries, and the journals. And um, they really did breathe life into this uh, story, time and again. Um, Lincoln I warmed to very quickly. Uh, when I finished The Burning of Washington, uh, it was published 1980, 19, uh, um, 88, uh, 1998. Uh, I don't think I knew Lincoln was the 16th president, but I warmed to him very quickly because he had the attributes that I most admire. Not only did he come up on his own steam, but he had an abundance of wisdom, compassion, humor, and judgment. This man, time and again, his humor was remarkable. I found in the Herndon White papers downstairs a poem he wrote as a little boy. Abram Lincoln is hand and pen. He will be good, but God knows when. And so there were flashes of this puckish sense of humor uh, from his boyhood. And it went into uh, late into life. He was uh, remarkable at this. He could pull stories, but the ma most amazing thing, he could make it relevant to the topic under discussion. And when he was running for re-election in Illinois to the state legislature, he had to debate his opponent in a little town. So he rode in, and on his way in, he noticed only one grand mansion, and above it was a lightning rod. He found out it belonged to the man he would debate the next day, and he also learned that this fellow had switched political parties to get a high-paying job. So the next day, this fellow got up first, and he made fun of Lincoln, and Lincoln just sat there and took it all. When it came his turn to talk, he rose and he said, Live long or die young. I have a lot of tricks to learn in the political world, but I would never switch political parties so that I could get a high-paying job that would enable me to build the grandest mansion in town, over which I would have to put a lightning rod to protect my guilty conscience from the wrath of God. <laughs> you see, that's his sense of humor, his compassion. 
you see it at the Lincoln Memorial, the open right hand, the clenched left fist. The open hand is symbolic of his tender, compassionate, forgiving nature. Often in, this, uh, in the war, a widow would come to him and plead for a reprieve for her only son who'd been ordered shot for sleeping on duty or desertion, and he would always grant the reprieve. He would say, it makes me feel rested after a hard day's work if I can find a good excuse to save a man's life. The clenched fist is this man's determination, the resolve to protect the Union, to, that, that it would not be divided into two separate countries. And at his first inaugural, addressing a secessionist at large, he said, you have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. And at a time when most people were screaming for the leaders of the rebellion to be hanged, what did this great man do with his great outreach, uh, waiting for the prodigal son to come back? He said, malice toward none and charity for all. That's what separates him from most and the other quality that he had. He didn't take insults to heart. He went to the home of a top general. The general was out at a wedding, so Lincoln and his secretary, John Hay, waited an hour, and the general came back, walked right past the room, went up to the, to the bedroom, and knowing he had bypassed the president, and John Hay was prepared to go and finish him off in bed. And Lincoln said, no, now is not the time to be making points of etiquette or personal dignity. In other words, he could separate the personal from uh, the man's ability. It's a rare quality. Um, he would also um, dismiss his wife's warnings. Beware of this one, he's after your job. That one's gonna stab you in the back. What did he do? He appointed one of them, Ch Salmon Chase, who was most uh, desirous of becoming president, appointed him chief justice. And he said to his wife, you are magnifying trifles. I should despise myself if I allowed my personal opinion of him to influence my judgment of his ability to handle the job. So here you man have a man of sterling character. And what a writer, what a writer. I rate him, I compare him to Mozart, because if you take away a note of Mozart, it collapses. If you take away a word of the Gettysburg Address, it's imperfect. And the only books lying around when he was growing up to guide him were the Bible, Shakespeare, Aesop's Fables, Pilgrim's Progress, A History of the U.S. and the Poetry of Robert Burns. I admire him for anybody who can understand Burns. but. <laughs> He got the cadences and the language from the Bible. Four scores biblical. Four scores, seven years. Of the people, by the people, for the people. You never read or listen to a monotonous, dull Lincoln speech. In my book, I say that not since Thomas Jefferson had a president given such clarity to content and sheathed it in such lyrical language. That's how I rate him. And it's not only the speeches, it's the letters. There is a letter on view now at the Lincoln uh, Malice Toward None exhibit in the Jefferson Building. It's a marvelous letter. He wrote to General Joe Hooker, appointing him to the command of the Army of the Potomac in January 1863. And there he says, I'm giving you the command of the Army of the Potomac, but there are some things I think it best for you to know that I am not quite satisfied with you. And this is where he, he divulges his great insight into people. He said, uh, I believe you to be a brave and a skillful soldier, which I like. I also believe that you don't mix politics in your profession, which is right. You have confidence in yourself, which is an invaluable, if not indispensable, quality. You are ambitious, which within reasonable bounds does good more than harm. So far, so good. Now he's going to tell him what he knows about him. However, during General Burnside's command of the army, I have heard that you have taken counsel of your ambition and thwarted him as much as you could, in which you did a great disservice to the country and to a most meritorious and honorable brother officer. It is not because of this, but in spite of it, that I have given you the command. Only those generals who have military success, he said, can appoint dictators, because he'd heard that uh, this man wanted to appoint uh, dictators in the army and the government. He said, what I ask of you now is success, and I will risk the dictatorship. However, 
I have much fear that the spirit you have infused into the army of withholding confidence from the commander and criticizing him will now turn on you. I will support you so far as I can. And now with his marvelous understanding of language, he says, beware of rashness. And he repeats it, beware of rashness. But with energy and sleepless vigilance, go forward and give us victories. Well, with all that as background, uh, you have to add his profound and uh, way of thinking and writing and offering it to the public with melodious expression. No wonder his legacy resonates down the centuries. I got a call four years ago from the Mandarin Hotel. Uh, there was a man with an Australian accent. He said, I would like you to take my wife and I around Washington to show just the sites connected with Lincoln's assassination. And during the walk, he told me that he had just quit as Prime Minister of New South Wales after a decade. And I said to him, why Lincoln? Why the assassination sites? He said, on the anniversary of Lincoln's death, every year I grieve. And I thought that was a startling measure of how the 16th president's legacy survives. Because if it can endure that long and affect a well-known person in distant Australia, imagine. You could say that about only a few people, but they said it about, he said it about Lincoln. So this is all background now. When he died, that legacy was so strong and the sense of grief was so strong. Imagine his 12-year-old son, Tad, was at the theater, at Grover's Theater, another theater, watching a performance of Aladdin or the Wonderful Lamp. He was there with the White House staffer. When somebody ran in and said the president had been shot, it was consternation and bewilderment. Until somebody stood up and said, this is the trick of the pickpockets, everybody should sit down again. And then a third person went on the stage and said the news was true. So Tad got back to the White House and he ran up to the doorkeeper, Thomas Pendle, and he cried out, Oh, Tom Penn, they have killed Papa dead. That's where I got the title of the book. And the next day, little Tad, with a cleft palate, was on the landing of a staircase and the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, passed by and Tad said, Oh, Mr. Wells, who killed my father? He couldn't reply, he had no answer and he couldn't hold back his tears. It was, somebody said, like a biblical plague, as if some Herod had robbed every home of its firstborn. John Nicolay, Lincoln's principal private secretary, came back the day after Lincoln died. He'd been in Charleston. And he came back and he wrote to his fiancee. I found the letters again in this building. And he said, the White House is as still and as dark almost as the grave. So that was the grief. And then there was, in those days, you showed your collective sign of uh, grief by hanging black material in your homes, your restaurants, shops, offices, hotels, everywhere. One man wrote back to his wife and he said that they had run out of black morning material in the shops and women were now tearing up their black dresses so they would have something to hang in the windows. So that's how it was affected. It was this black, like a black shroud over the capital. So emphatic, so heavy, so plentiful. An expression of collective grief. And then very quickly, the grief turned to a visceral preference for revenge. Vengeance at all costs. The mood cut right across the spectrum. People who should have known better, intellectuals, reacted like the mob. I found the letter of a man in Cleveland, Ohio, who wrote to his close friend, the Chief Justice of the DC Supreme Court. And he said, quote, much as I have denounced the barbarity of the Spanish Inquisition, now I say give us back the rack so that they may feel its terrible rending powers and be glad to reveal all they know of damnable conspiracy. And when this rage, it actually went right up into the highest levels of the government. The Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, 
wanted to punish these suspects long bef before they'd been charged even, two months before the verdicts came down, these people were put in cells in what is now the um, uh, Fort McNair. There was a penitentiary building there. Each cell was three and a half feet wide by seven feet long, designed by Charles Bullfinch three decades earlier to hold a single inmate in one cell. And they faced the opposite end of the neighboring cells so that the inmates wouldn't be able to see or speak to their neighbors. They had canvas hoods put over their heads, tied tightly around their necks. There was a slit to breathe and to eat. And the canvas hit uh, their eye sockets, was very painful. After six weeks, the prison doctor, doing his rounds every day, wrote to the prison governor and said, if you do not take those off, the Secretary of War will have, quote, a bunch of lunatics, unquote, on his hands. And so they were removed, except with the exception of Lewis Payne, who stabbed the Secretary of State. Their minds were wandering. The terrible rest uh, strictures of those... Uh, of those uh, confinement in those uh, cells and uh, damp and drab, claustrophobic, plus the um, uh, canvas hoods, which were put on immediately the court adjourned for lunch or at the end of the day. They were taken back and they were immediately clamped with these tormenting hoods. Uh, one of the men who was sent to prison afterwards, he was Edmund Spangler. He was one of those really affected. His mind was wandering, according to the prison governor. He had been used to riding horses, romping in the fields with his dogs, crabbing and fishing in the summer. He couldn't take it. He called it the, uh, the torture of the, uh, of the bags. And the prison doctor described them as the uh, uh, sweat bath to the head. So this is what uh, unforgiving and merciless. There were parallels with today. Without my getting into politics at all, I'm just giving the parallels that existed today and, uh, and then. Stanton, the Secretary of War, was determined to flout the law. Uh, he didn't want to know anything about the Fifth Amendment where uh, you cannot be, um, you have to have an indictment from a grand jury if it's a capital or infamous crime. Uh, they just uh, um, overlooked that. And Lincoln's first, uh, first Attorney General, Edward Bates, described the court, uh, the military tribunal, he said, is unlawful. We are a government of laws, and the laws are strong enough to rule the people. So there was uh, an outcry. A lot of mid-Atlantic papers took issue with this uh, military trial. See, the military trial, the rules of evidence were less stringent, and they only had to have a simple majority to convict and a two-thirds majority to hang. A civil trial would have required a unanimous decision from the, uh, from the jury. That they knew they would never get in Washington, which was divided right down the middle. A lot of people siding with the South, others devoted to the Union. And one of the um, conspirators who fled to Europe, they captured him two, two years later, uh, John Surratt, he was put before a civil uh, uh, trial when he got back, and of course the jury couldn't agree, and he was freed, much to the consternation and anger of many people. But they were unanimous in one thing, that the, the spirit and the letter of the law had been followed. And so with that as uh, background, I'm going to take you now as if you were participants or spectators in Washington in... Um, on the 14th of April, 1865, Good Friday, Lincoln got to the theater late. It was a comedy, our American cousin. The actors recognized him, they stopped acting. They played hail to the chief, he took off his top hat and bowed. And then he went with his bowed head and drooping shoulders to the box, 12 feet above the stage on the right of the stage, as you're looking at the stage. He and his wife went in, and his two guests, Henry Rathburn, a 27-year-old army major, and his fiancée, Clara Harris, who was the daughter of Senator Ira Harris. On the second scene of the third act, Booth came up and shot Lincoln behind the left ear. There was no security. He got through easily. And when the smoke cleared, Henry jumped up and struggled with Booth. Booth took a, uh, He dropped his single-shot Derringer pistol and took out his knife, and he lunged at Henry. 
Henry put up his left arm to deflect the blow and got wounded between the shoulder and the elbow, so he loosened his grip. Booth jumped onto the stage 12 feet below, and how audacious he was in front of more than 1,600 people. They let me into Lincoln's box while I was writing this, and it seems like a 20-foot drop. It's like when I was a child. I was always scared of jumping off the 20-foot diving board, and I remember in Lincoln's box I had the same feeling. Um, and so... He jumped on there, but he had a spur on the back of his boot, and he caught on a flag draped over the front of the box. So he stumbled awkwardly onto the stage, cracking his leg bone, but he still managed to stand up with his knife in his hand, and he screamed out the Latin motto of Virginia, so always to tyrants. He escaped out the back door onto his waiting horse. They cornered him in a Virginia barn 12 days later, and against orders, a cavalryman shot him through the neck, and he died a few hours later having whispered in the ears of the cavalrymen, tell my mother I did it for my country. So there was no remorse until the bitter end. Well, the first surgeon to reach him was 23-year-old, uh, to reach Lincoln, was 23-year-old Dr. Charles Leal, who'd gone to the theater, hoping to get another look at Lincoln, whom he'd seen three, week, three days earlier addressing the crowds from the open window above the front door of the White House. He couldn't get over his divine appearance. He had to see him again. And Leal was one of the few people who realized what had happened. On 9-11, I was watching NBC, and the commentator said, there has to be a navigational error. A second plane has hit the World Trade Center. He couldn't believe what he was watching. The same in Ford's theater. It had never happened before that a president had been sh assassinated, shot at but not killed. And so they were stunned. Dr. Leal realized. He climbed over the um, uh, chairs and he pushed there to go as a side and in direct line to Lincoln's box. Henry held up his wounded arm and asked for help. The doctor put his hand under Henry's chin, looked into his eyes, realized he was in no immediate danger. Then he turned his attention to Mrs. Lincoln, who was crying out, Oh, doctor, is he dead? Can he recover? Will you take charge? Do what you can. Oh, my dear husband. She was holding him upright. If she hadn't, he would have toppled over. He looked dead. His head was thrown forward. His eyes were closed. He couldn't feel a pulse. So he laid him flat on the floor. Then he felt what seemed like blood on his left shoulder. So he told a bystander, William Kent, to help cut open the president's coat and shirt from his neck to his elbow. He didn't find a wound, but the body was cold. Um, the, 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 until he saw, sorry, until he saw a dilated pupil. Then he realized he had suffered brain damage. So he quickly found the wound behind the left ear, poked loose the coagulating blood to relieve pressure on the brain. Uh, pressed the diaphragm up to draw in air and breathed into Lincoln's mouth and nose. And when the heartbeat improved, he realized he wouldn't die immediately. But he uttered the terrible words that were flashed across the country. His wound is mortal. It is impossible for him to recover. And at that moment, Dr. Charles Taft clambered into the box from the stage. He'd been sitting in the orchestra level directly under Lincoln's box. He jumped onto the stage, announced he was a military surgeon. Two men bent over. He used their backs as a bridge to claw his way up. And a third physician would be attending Lincoln now, a trio. So Dr. Leal said, we cannot take him to the White House over the bumpy road or put him in a sitting position. We have to take him to the nearest private home. So they took him, tried to take him through the audience. And some of the military in the audience used their swords and bayonets to create a path. And they got down to the stairs leading to the lobby. They wheeled around so those taking Lincoln's legs would go down first. Excuse me one second. And then as they carried him, somebody said, where should we take him? They, again, the military created a path for them to cross the, this jam-packed 10th Street Henry Safford, a War Department clerk, was standing on the steps of a four-story brick building diagonally opposite. He said, bring him in here. So they took him up the steps, past two parlors on the left, down a narrow corridor into a little room at the back, a bedroom. He'd come full circle. It was like a log cabin. And the bed was small, the original you can see in the Chicago History Museum. So the doctor said, take it off, take off the end of the bed. They couldn't. He said, break it. They couldn't. So we laid him diagonally across. Then he ordered everybody out. He wanted to look for more wounds. So that meant taking his clothes off. 
and Mrs. Lincoln left also. He didn't find a wound, but the body was cold, and so he went sent for warm blankets, bottles of hot water, and after these were applied, he called Mrs. Lincoln back. She sat by the head of the bed, and then people started to arrive. Robert, the oldest son, the surgeon general, the private physician, the pastor. And when the private physician arrived, he inserted a thin metal probe into the wound. When it touched the ball fired by Booth, he realized that he wouldn't die immediately, but he uttered the terrible words that were flashed across the country. As wound is mortal, it is impossible for him to recover. That's, I'm sorry, that he'd said earlier. He now told Robert, sorry, he now told Robert that there's no hope that uh, there's nothing more he could do other than to monitor the pulse and respiration and keep the wound open. And so Robert divided his time between comforting his mother in the front parlor and weeping beside his father's bedside. Edwin Stanton arrived with the Chief Justice of the DC Supreme Court. They monitored evidence from some of the eyewitnesses and Stanton was the one who took charge. He kept demanding, guard the Potomac from the city down, he will try to go south. Mrs. Lincoln went in once an hour to sit by the bed, and in her last visit, his breathing became loud and heavy. So she stood up, cried out, and fainted. And when he heard this, the Secretary of War came in from the adjoining room, and he roared, Take that woman out. Do not let her in again. So she never saw her husband again, dead or alive. She was five weeks in her dimly lit room in the White House, so overcome she couldn't even attend a funeral service in the White House or the burial in Springfield. And um, the Surgeon General had his, uh, the, uh, the uh, doctor, uh, Charles Leal, in one of the most poignant moments of the night, held the President's right hand. He knew that he was blind, judging by the paralysis the dilated pupils, the bloodshot and protruding eyes, which were now insensitive to light. But he thought he might be able to feel, he might be able to hear. If he could, he wanted him to know that he had a friend, that he was in touch with humanity. And um, the Surgeon General had his head periodically over Lincoln's heart. At 7.22 a.m., Saturday the 15th of April, 1865, Lincoln died. So they put his lifeless hands over his still chest and everybody kneeled down as the pastor offered up a prayer for the bereaved family and the stricken nation. And that was when the Secretary of War lost control of his emotions. The same man, Edwin Stanton, 10 years earlier, had been the lead counsel on a defense team, where a patent infringement case, where Lincoln had been the junior uh, lawyer. And Stanton, within earshot of Lincoln, had insulted him. He said, who is that long-armed ape who knows nothing? Now the same Stanton wept uncontrollably into the blankets and uttered the immortal words, now he belongs to the ages. And um, then they, put, uh, they closed the eyelids, put some coins on there, and Dr. Leal went out alone deep in thought. It was cold and drizzling. He was bareheaded. He left his hat in Ford's Theatre. He would never wash the blood of his cuffs. They would be a personal keepsake of a man he regarded as a martyr. Robert took his mother back to the White House. Um, and uh, when she got to the front door, she looked across at Ford's Theatre and she cried out, That dreadful house, that dreadful house. Most of the weeping mourners in the street were now black people. And one of them would later write, they had just lost their Moses. They had the autopsy uh, at noon, uh, less than uh, four hours later, and um, less than five hours later. And um, Lincoln's warm and limp body was laid out on the boards, and it was covered by towels and sheets. And Surgeon Edward Curtis, who would be one of those performing the cranial autopsy, looked at this figure and he couldn't believe how strong Lincoln was. He looked at the strong bones and the well-rounded muscles. And then when they, they cut off his scalp, unafraid of uh, an affront to the president's dignity or uh, um, defiling the body of the commander in chief, they went about their business like professionals and they cut the scalp from ear to ear, pulled it off, and then they sawed off the top of his head and reached in to bring out the brain to look for the path of the bullet, of uh, the ball. 
and they could quite clearly see it, a line of clotted blood, and blood smeared over the hemispheres of the brain had congealed. And um, then the ball fell through the hand, the fingers of uh, one of the surgeons. In it fell with a clutter into a white china basin on the floor. And the surgeon looked at it, and he couldn't believe that this little thing, smaller than the tip of his little finger, had felled this giant amongst humanity. And so um, that is how that terrible day ended with the autopsy. I think I'm going to call it quits there. Um, I hope I haven't spoiled your lunches. Uh, uh, but um, one has to be vivid. I didn't hold back any punches in this because, um, like William Manchester, I was very young when Kennedy was shot. He gave it all, warts and all. And uh, I haven't read that book since uh, he wrote it. But I remember at the time he had given the vivid detail, and that's what I wanted to do in this book. Um, so, do we have any questions? Yes. Have you ever pro come across any evidence that the Confederate government itself was involved in the conspiracy? The question was did I ever find any evidence that the Confederate government I it was involved, knew about it, or is there any documentary evidence? No, I tried mightily. But nobody has ever found that paper trail. And that's why this will be like the Kennedy assassination. The first author claiming to have written a definitive book is delusional and has um, got a, a great sense of um, his own fame because nobody can write the definitive story. There's so many unanswered questions. The one I, in addition to that, that I tried my best to locate the confession made by David Herald, one of the four who were hanged. He asked permission to write a confession and they gave him time and he took his time in the courtroom and it wasn't in session. We've never been able to find it. Yes. Yes, I wanted to ask you a question uh, with regard to the counterfactual stuff. You know, you talked about the JFK assassination. You've uh, had a lot of historical precedents recently with Barack Obama's election. I mean, there's been a trend towards comparing him to FDR, um, towards the Phillips family, the Goodwin Cook, the Goodwin Cook. Um, the one I was talking about was, for instance, I saw, I, I met Max Hastings at Gordon Cook uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I'll tell you very briefly, I try to uh, avoid hypotheticals because that's where you get into hot water and uh, you can, everybody can contradict one another. There's, uh, hypotheticals uh, will always be hypotheticals. Um, but the, the key to how it might have been turned out differently is Lincoln's very words, malice toward none, charity for all. That says it all, in my opinion. And he understood people uh, with an uncanny insight. And Andrew Johnson didn't even know what insight into people meant. That was the difference. That's why one was impeached and one lives on. And I think that's key to what might have happened. This very big heart, this very wise brain. Yes. Okay, um, do I think some of the people who were convicted should not have been convicted? A lot of people today maintain that Mary Surratt should not have been found guilty. She was the victim of circumstantial evidence. Um, two things, two counts, three counts against her. She ran a boarding house which is still there in Chinatown. Booth visited often, some of the conspirators stayed there. 
Everybody inside that boarding house was arrested on three nights after the assassination, between 10 and 11 p.m. While this was going on, the man who had been delegated by Booth to assassinate the Secretary of State arrived carrying a pickaxe. The detectives asked him, what are you doing here? He said, I've come to ask Mrs. Surratt last minute instructions about digging a ditch in her backyard the next day. They asked her, do you know this man? She said, no. Have you seen him before? No. He'd stayed there. Secondly, Booth visited her about um, at 2 p.m. that afternoon of the assassination, which took place just after 10 p.m. And he later told one of the conspirators, this was found out in 1977, uh, Joan Chaconis, former president of the Surat Society, found this document in the hands of a descendant of one of the trial lawyers. George Atzerat, a convicted conspirator, said Booth told him Mrs. Surat went to her tavern, um, this is in Clinton, Maryland, south of Washington, to get the weapons ready that Booth would use that night on his escape. So we finally had that, and another conspirator, Lewis uh, uh, David Herald, told his lawyers that old woman is, is in it uh, as deep as all of us. Um, and then another circumstantial thing was that she, the weapons, when she went to uh, ask the uh, lessee of that tavern to, uh, to get them ready, he described in court that he was, quote, right smart in liquor. In other words, he was drunk. But he swore that those are the words she said, and the court accepted that. Well, the, the, the judges did anyway, so she was hanged. And they didn't think a woman would be hanged right until the end when they were tying her arms and legs. It had never happened before under the authority of the federal government. And they had relay runners on every block expecting a reprieve from the White House or a commutation. It never came. And the president had sat with the judge advocate general in the library of the White House, and they said... We should not commute her sentence on the grounds of her gender, because if we did that, females would take the lead in committing crimes. <laughs> yes. Okay, his name is Samuel Mudd. Booth was in excruciating pain. He had to have attended to. And David Held, right in with him, said, if you veer off course, uh, we're going to lose the advantage of fleeing at night in a straight line. They veered off course. They went to Mudd's house in Charles County. Mudd claimed he didn't recognize Booth. He said he had a beard, whiskers, um, a mustache, and a shawl around his neck, and he didn't recognize him. Later, he confessed under three days of relentless interrogation that he did recognize him, but he still maintained his innocence that he knew nothing about the assassination plot. Booth had stayed there before, uh, on one occasion, a few months before. We will never know whether Mudd was telling a truth or not that about the assassination, that he was uh, ignorant of that plot. I tend to believe that he was telling a truth, but he could not admit it at the time. If he had admitted it at the time, he would have landed up on the gallows, that's for certain. And he was saved from the gallows by a single vote, five to four. You had to have the two-thirds majority to sentence to hang. So he served four years in prison before Andrew Johnson pardoned them, the, those imprisoned. Yes. Where was he? I've been talking into the wrong mic all the time. This is where it's coming from. Oh my God. Um, Andrew Johnson was staying at the Kirkwood House Hotel at 12th and Pennsylvania, and he was in room 68 overlooking 12th Street, two blocks from the White, from the Ford's Theatre. Um, he knew within minutes what had happened, because one of the people at Ford's Theatre was Leonard Fowle, a former governor of Wisconsin, who was also staying at the Kirkwood House, where he had socialized with the vice president in Johnson's rooms. And as soon as the shot was fired, Fowle, uh, realized that the vice president's life was in danger because he had recently read a widely reprinted item from a December issue of the Selma, Alabama Dispatch in which a southerner offered to kill the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state in return for a million dollars. So he ran over to the Kirkwood house and he screamed at the clerks to guard the door, the staircase, and the vice president's rooms. And then he ran up the stairs and he pounded on Johnson's doors. Governor Johnson, using a former title, if you are in, I must see you. 
Johnson said, is that you, Farmer? I said, yes, let me in. When he did, told him everything that had happened, they clasped hands and embraced in a show of mutual support. And then when more of Johnson's friends came, he told Farwell to bring him an update. He came back with the sad news that the president was dying and the Secretary of State had been gravely wounded. So against the advice of everybody, put on his hat and coat, lowered his hat, pushed through the crowds, stayed a few minutes by Lincoln's bedside, according to the quartermaster general who was there, got back to the hotel, and that morning at 11 a.m. was sworn in by Chief Justice Salmon Chase, and it paralleled Johnson taking over from Kennedy. Kennedy's men wrote off Johnson as a hick. They didn't like him, but they rallied around the new leader. Immediately he was president. The same happened. Nobody could fill Lincoln's shoes, but they rallied around this new president. Lincoln's last speech was th three days before he was shot. He came to the open window above the front door of the White House. There was a massive crowd there. They spilled over into Lafayette Park because Richmond had fallen eight days earlier and Lee had surrendered to Grant 48 hours earlier. So Lincoln was the hero of the, of the day. And he came to that open window and for the first time in public he said, black should be allowed to vote. Booth turned to one of his co-conspirators, David Herald, and whispered a racist curse. Then he turned to another conspirator, Lewis Payne, and said, shoot him. And Payne refused. He said it was too risky. He walked around Lafayette Square, and that was when Booth uttered his chilling vow in these words, that is the last speech you will ever make. And three days later, he shot him. But he had made up his mind long before, months before. In fact, when Lincoln was elected in 1864, that's when Booth realized this is the end of the South. He called him a tyrant. He wanted him removed by any means, and he blamed Lincoln for destroying or wanting to destroy the culture of the South, which included slavery. So the, the feeling was there, the animus, but the actual, um, in, uh, the go-ahead to go on the plot was decided on the day of the assassination at about noon when the news appeared in the paper that Lincoln would be appearing at Fort's Theater that night. All right, well, Anthony Pitch has done it again. It's really been a wonderful, wonderful talk. I feel like I've had an Edward R. Murrow experience, you know, that we've <laughs> been here and we've learned more details than uh, I'd ever even read before until, of course, I read his book. So if you would join me in a final round of applause, we will then have the book signed.